the second part of uh, today is about reframing the library and uh, trying to uh, build an in indoor uh, IoT living lab. Um, one second. So, and it's what we call smart library. This one doesn't work? Yeah? No. I'll just use this. OK. Um, this is also a statement that I've been thinking about a lot about. Um, and we really had to create our own future with this uh, smart library. I will not be recording right now, but I have been. Uh, and this is my family again. But this right here, ironically, smart library is a lot about putting up sensors in the library. And a couple of months ago, I had a sensor put into myself. Uh, it's, it's a pacemaker. So now I'm officially uh, a self-tracker, not just by my pacemaker that uh, looks at my heart the whole time, but also my watch and uh, that <clears throat> kind of follows me. But enough about that. Um, <laughs> this is a book I recently read. And I thought when I was going to Spain, everybody would have read it. But I found out that uh, not everybody has read this book. Uh, I was very fascinated with it. Um, and it gave me a good view of the history of, uh, of Spain and uh, Barcelona. And this is a good uh, example of how, um, how history has been recorded. It's been recorded uh, through text uh, and pictures and stuff like that. And a couple of years ago, everything was digitized. And that was actually just the text being digital. We're going to, uh, to the next phase what is, which is uh, datification. Um, and what that means is that reality is recorded through senses. And that will be recorded for history. And so history can be relived and can be, can be well, well, relived um, in the future and look back at that in another way. So it will not just be text in the future, it will be data representing history. So the agenda for, for this speak right now will be first why we're building it, and the implementation, three areas in focus, and some final notes. So as I said earlier, this, this library was built uh, for books and not for people. Um, and that was a big change for our library that, uh, that we became a, a really big success. Um, it really changed in uh, 2013 when we rebuilt the library then. Uh, we went from uh, 100,000 visitors a year to a million visitors a year. And we have about two and a half thousand visitors a day, which means that it's almost one fourth of all students that comes to our library every day. So of course that created uh, issues with, uh, with heat. A lot of people generate a lot of heat and our ventilation system was not good enough for that. Uh, a lot of people generate a lot of smell. Our ventilation couldn't handle that either. 
Um, and a lot of people create a lot of noise. And all the books were taken out of the library, as I, was, I said we did 15 years ago. So there was not really any books to, to, uh, to uh, help with the acoustics. And also, as I said earlier, the light, uh, the light was built for books. So it was just enough light so you could pull, pull the, bull, uh, the book down from the shelves, uh, which is about 250 lux. But good reading light is about 450 lux. So we needed to change that too. And we became aware, uh, much more aware of the comfort uh, level of our students. That uh, research shows that you can learn, uh, you have a much bigger chance of learning something in a room when, the, when, you're, when you feel comfortable. And some of the comfort comes from the indoor climate. So, and it also uh, comes from feeling safe. It feel, comes from feeling at home. So this really became a, a mantra for, for us to, to reach people's comfort level so, so we could make the, the optimal uh, conditions for learning. We still had these uh, restrictions, as I was saying, big um, events. And so we had to build a flexible space where we would take the furniture out um, and put it back in. So that's what we had to th think about. And when we started to think about installing all these sensors, um, we also became aware of the Internet of Things and how this is going to grow uh, exponentially. And it's, it's going to be a huge industry, just like VR and augmented reality. So we figured, OK, this is definitely something we want to support and we want to support our students in, in this case. Um, our rector was also saying that uh, he wanted to everybody at our university to spark innovation. So this was also an incentive for us to, to do something different and to reframe the library. We're actually number nine right now in, uh, in Europe. Uh, which we have become over the last five years. And it is not just our university. The, the government is doing a lot to, to uh, motivate everybody and to make investments uh, so Denmark can be in front uh, digitally. Um, so this is from a report that came out last year from the government. And on the left here, you can see many of the technologies that they have aimed at. And in the report, too, it shows uh, how big or how fast uh, the industry is changing these days, or the business model of, um, of, uh, of companies or a technology. Um, you can see the phone, it took 75 years to reach 50 million users, but only seven days for Super Mario Run to, to reach 50 million users. This just goes so quick, so, but it's also over fast. So this is where Denmark really wants to be ahead. So, and right here on the left, you can see uh, from a report from World Economic Forum that Denmark is actually in front when we talk about the digital uh, development. Uh, you can see that on the left. And you can actually see on the right, too, that Spain is actually the country in the world that is the fastest growing within this. So. Uh, you're definitely doing a lot of the right things here in Spain. 
Uh, Denmark is not quite as quick within the development of, uh, of or it's not going as quick as we want it to. So this is what the government really wants to do. You can also see over on the right uh, that it's only 20% of, of the students coming out of our universities that are coming out with STEM competences. And that is, that is not enough. We have to have more than that. You can see actually Spain is, has about 25% of, of your students coming out with STEM competences. So a lot of motivation to, to build this uh, smart library. So, but it started out with a lot of workshops. Actually, it started out way back in 13 when we had all these issues. But then we started having workshops with students, with researchers. Uh, how should we build this living lab? What would it take for them to use it? And they came up with some ideas. They came up with technology that they wanted to use. Um, so it has only been with their help that we have uh, come so far. Um, and as I showed you earlier, we came up with this vision for, for the smart library. And the good thing about this is that we're both we're, we're developing uh, the library. And on the same time, we're actually boosting the chances of the students learning. Um, so, and when learning is very essential for us as a library, it's, well, it's very essential. We, we don't just want to deliver information. We want to create learning in the heads of the students and the researchers. So the, after a lot of years and applying for the money to renovate the library, uh, it finally came through the last summer. We closed down for four months and we were only allowed to have 349 people at a time in the library. It was just built for books, not for people. So, so we had to build uh, fire escapes, uh, routes and doors and all that. And now we can be 1,300 people in the library. Um, up top, you can see some glass in the atrium. And that was, that was for two reasons, just so we can divide the library up into two fire zones. So we could be 1,300 people. And also because of the acoustics from all the events in the library, we were hoping that would help too. And it has helped. So, but we have decided we are not a quiet library. We want dialogue in our library, so we have no, well, we might have still a few, but I'm taking all the signs down that says, shh. So, so it's not a quiet library. Um, right here, you can see up in the ceiling, we have put up uh, cable channels where the lighting uh, is put on. And that is uh, part of the infrastructure that's very important for, for our smart library because then you can put up sensors very easy. You can just put them up there and there's power right there. You don't need an electrician to come and put up new sensors. So we put together a small video of the renovation. Sound. We need the sound on. It's on.
So we opened up in uh, November again. And the 3,600 square meters uh, were improved with uh, new acoustic ceilings. Uh, ventilation system that uh, can ventilate only where there are people and when it's needed. So it can detect from temperature and the CO2 level in the room if uh, it's needed, if ventilation is needed and the amount that is needed. A lot of extra power sockets, you probably all heard that, that the students wanted. Um, and then of course sprinkler system, fire alarm systems, all that for, for safety. Uh, the light is, uh, is very important. It's, a, it's dynamic light, it's LED. And this was one of the arguments that we were using for the estate that if they wanted to put in new lights, then two years from now, they would have that money back in savings. So we're actually saving about 200,000 euros each year in power that we're saving just from the lighting. Because we're open 24 seven and that meant that there was light all, all night long, all day long. So, but dynamic means that uh, it follows the daylight outside. So it's reddish in the morning it's bluish in the afternoon, and then it turns red again at, uh, at night. And this is something our body actually likes, to follow the light uh, and the curve of the light outside. And it can also see if it's sunny, and there's a lot of sun coming into the library, then the, the light dims down because we don't need as much light. Um, and we found out a lot about light talking to professors at our university that uh, what the impact of light is. And so, and, and we said, okay, what can we do to turn our library into a research facility for you? And they said, well, divide it into zones so we can test different things out that takes place in the library and how people react to different lighting in the library. So we did that, we divided it into 27 zones. Um, five of them are manual, so students themselves can, uh, can uh, control it uh, depending on what situation that they're in. Some of them might have to turn in the paper early in the morning and and have to stay up all night. Then they'll turn up the strength, so the lux level comes over 450, and then your body will start to create adrenaline. That'll keep you awake. Same thing, you turn the bluish on in the light, and your body thinks it's still day. So you'll be able to work all night. And the red is, uh, is something you can use in situations where you have group discussions or meetings because we're all more likely to talk to each other when the light is red because we all, we all look better uh, in red light. So, and we're more likely to talk to people that look good than not. So, and that's what I'm talking about when we need to talk to researchers and understand their what they're searching, what they're researching. Uh, so, then we have put up a bunch of sensors, uh, eye beacons, which are uh, Bluetooth antennas. Uh, they work like uh, indoor GPS. Microphones to track the noise level all over the library. Temperature, humidity, and uh, one of the most important things is cameras. Um, these cameras, we have about 100 cameras uh, tracking everything that goes on in the library anonymously. So everybody is just a dot 
but it picks up data and creates data on how movement takes place by the two and a half thousand people there every day. And that can be used for research too. In correlation often with, with uh, the indoor climate, it's very important to, to researchers to, uh, to have it's like a, a uh, well, to find out what's real. And all their measurements right now, they, they, they're not really real. The camera is the best uh, sensor to sense what is real. So it, it tracks everything that goes on. Demographics, when you walk into the library, we track uh, gender and age um, of people coming in. And heat map, track map, and it just came out with a new algorithm that can track chairs, tables. So now we have the opportunity of seeing when is there an available seat and give that service to students even before they come to the library of where are the available seats. And maybe in the future, very soon, we can predict when there will be available seats. So uh, using artificial intelligence to, to predict what's, what's going to happen in the library. And when we have this down, we can use it to the rest of the university. Um, this is an example of the track map that we can, we can do. We can see what areas of the library is being used and which are not being used. Um, and if certain areas of the library is not being used, then we can start to have a discussion of why is that place not being used as much as the other spaces? And might we, have, might we want to do something else, change the furniture or the design of the, of the space? So to use all these senses, we have come up with this vision of how we can, a little bit about how we can use the senses. is actually what some of our students right now is working on in the augmented reality project. Um, yes, I'll pass that. Uh, to control all this, uh, this, this project, we of course are aiming at the strategic uh, objectives of the university. And so we're following this plan right here. And I've shown you earlier the objectives uh, to create competitive experimental facilities um, and some other objectives. So these are the three uh, main areas that we have decided to focus on in this project because these are the areas that we think will, will um, will help the university in the best way. Uh, it's the learning common, data innovation, and facility management. And we do know they overlap a little bit, but uh, it just shows that everything is connected when it comes to data. So the learning common uh, is about comfort. And as I was saying earlier, uh, the comfort level of our students is very important to us because learning is the very essential part of why our students should use our library. So we want to offer students to be able to come into the library and to either find their comfort level, meaning the temperature is right, the noise level is right, CO2 level is right, the lighting is right, uh, and maybe the amount of people is right. So, and if they can't find that, 
maybe they can go to a space and they can adjust that. So, and we'll use technology to make these services available. And of course, uh, economics is very important for us. Uh, and we're working together with companies, uh, and I'll, I'll get back to that about uh, the economics, but uh, what we've decided is we don't want to buy cheap furniture anymore. We just want to go with the best furniture there is because we want to give the students the best chances of learning while they're sitting there in our library. So better to invest in good furniture and have fewer of it, I think. So we have decided to start up uh, creating an app that can bring some of these new services uh, in, in, in use. Uh, to start out with, we have put up uh, 12 touch screens in the library so students can walk into the library and see the current status in the 27 zones uh, of, and maybe find their comfort level that way. So when it comes to services, uh, we really want to use these sensors to create these new services. And it's pretty much about answering these when, where, who, how for students. Uh, and we can use the technology to do that. Um, wayfinding, and we're working on that, but it's not just going to be just a library and finding your way around the library. It'll be used at the whole university. And right now, we're, doing, we're using the Wi-Fi access points to, uh, to track where people are moving or where the, the, the phones are moving uh, or the computers are moving because uh, it's, it's them asking for Wi-Fi all the time. And that combined with technology like iBeacons, um, then we can do uh, a very good uh, wayfinding tool indoor too. Um, we'll be using it, uh, this, all this data too, for wayfinding, like finding free computers um, and for signs in the library. We wouldn't need signs anymore if, if you could just see it all through a screen. But it'll be a couple of years before that comes along. Um, the wayfinding project I was telling you earlier about the, the books, finding the books. One service that students uh, were looking for is this watch me, don't watch me. Uh, as an example, we have open 24 seven. So many of our students are on campus at night studying there. And sometimes they actually want a security guard or somebody to watch them. So they actually want a, a button they could press and say, okay, watch me till I get home or till I leave campus. Um, another service they want is when they have to go to the bathroom or something else, either they have to leave their stuff at their place or uh, they have to pack it all up and, and maybe have lost their seat when they come back. <laughs> They want us to use the technology to solve that too. The second area of focus that we have is data innovation. And I was talking about you earlier about what will be the 21st century skills that our students need. And we're not sure, but we do know that for engineers, data and understanding data will be very important. So, so these are, uh, so about building the infrastructure in the library uh, was a lot about putting up uh, gateways that, that uh, the, the sensor data can go through in the library. Go, and it, you can go through the Wi-Fi, you can go through Bluetooth. The connectivity like Sigfox and, and LoRa as, as tools so students can come right from the street and put up their sensor and they can get data from it right away. 
Um, at DTU, there's about 300,000 sensors in all the buildings at campus. And right now, we are collecting most of that data. Uh, so over the last two years, there's been a lot of programming so we can collect the data. We don't know if it's going to be used, but data is going to be essential and so, worth so much in the future that our researchers are going to look back and see, OK, how has the history been of this building, the indoor climate in this building and stuff. So, and this will be made available uh, op as open data too, not just for researchers or students at DTU, but for everybody. So this is our first draft data model uh, that we are still working on uh, trying to uh, connect. The red ones there are all the sensors that uh, we've put up. And right now, we have tried to connect them all to uh, a Microsoft Surface uh, service called Azure, which is uh, uh, probably the best IoT uh, cloud solution uh, that, is, that exists right now. And uh, from Azure, the students can build on top of that data. They can build apps, web services, and many other things right on top of that. So we're just trying to make it easy for people to use data. And uh, we use uh, Figshare at uh, our university as a data repository. And we will do uh, data dumps from Asha into Figshare when it becomes historical. So, so we can save it for later. And we'll give it a, a DOI when we put it into Figshare. So then it can be used for research and for uh, articles. And all of this will be connected to our library system. So when you search for something in our library system, you can also get uh, packages of data. Um, So lots and lots of data <laughs> is going to be collected. And, and I see it very much like a tree stump here that the, the amount of data is just, it's just growing and growing. And I have heard somebody say that 90% uh, of all the data that is stored in the world right now has been stored within the last two years. Only 10% is from before that. So the amount of data is just incredible, and it will just be incredible in the future. And it will be gold in the future. So the red uh, lines here are showing that uh, different ways of using this data. So you might have a researcher wanting to, to look at data from the, way the beginning, when the tree was just so small, and then all the way till now. And then other researchers might want to look across and look at temperature, CO2 level at a certain time, uh, maybe 2018. So it's just a represent representation of that. And uh, we have had the discussion at our university whether uh, you should only save research data but uh, we don't agree because data might become uh, very important for research, but they don't know it yet. So, so we're saving it even though it has not been uh, used for research. So, and we do believe that data is gonna be very important for, for us as a library in the future um, and that we, as libraries, play a big role in democracy. And so, so data is not just uh, something that should be stored by uh, big companies and owned by big companies. This should be stored and saved by libraries and be open data. Um, 
Yes. We are also trying a little test on how this data that we're collecting, uh, how does that match up with, uh, with user uh, UX lib? I don't know if you've heard of that. It's like uh, this right here is uh, the method uh, behavioral mapping where somebody has been sitting in the library watching what was goes on uh, at, the, at the desk. And at the same time, we've, we've used data from the sensors to see if we can, can get to the same conclusions with data from sensors and from the human eye. And I must say, I don't think we're quite there yet uh, with sensors uh, because the human eye also has a brain behind it and is very subjective and can, uh, can analyze on the same time. But uh, we'll get there with uh, artificial intelligence. But I believe that it's methods that can, that can be combined to find out what really goes on in the library. Um, many others, like Lieber, is looking at what skills are needed for libra library professionals, uh, the same as us. But I don't, I don't know for sure what skills are needed. But uh, we are just jumping into it uh, at, at our university, at our library. This is a report, uh, uh, the Horizon Report from 2017, saying where should all we libraries be at this, this moment? And it's saying right now that we should all be working with big data and digital scholarship technologies. So, um, and I, I don't think many of us are doing it, but this is what we actually should be doing. And right here they're saying library service platforms, meaning that our library should be on many different platforms and it should be personalized. So, so it's much easier for you as a user to get the information that you want. Um, so that's something to work on. And of course, artificial intelligence and Internet of Things. We're not working with artificial intelligence yet, but we're hoping very soon to get started on it. So, um, so at, at uh, our library, we have started up trying to give our employees skills to help students and researchers. We have started up something called DTU Hack Lab in the library where students, employees at the library, and researchers together can just meet up and help each other co-creating uh, knowledge. And, and you don't have to be very good, you just have to come and want to learn. And we have arranged a couple of, uh, of meetings, too, for, for libra library professionals in the, North, in the Scandinavian countries to, uh, to train them uh, to be data scientists. So here's a Why little... Why are you here oh. today? Sound? Sound. No technicians? Oh. Huh? Why are you here today? Um, I'm attending this uh, hack because I want to learn from the students and I want to share what we are working on in the library also to the students. Well, you probably couldn't hear it. <laughs> this is uh, one of our lab librarians that uh, was attending one of the hack labs. So, as what I stumbled upon the other day from uh, uh, Code Academy was was this that this is actually the best one of the, the best jobs that are out there right now for students is to be a data scientist. So uh, we are aiming at some of the right things and. We do have a computer, uh, 
an institute uh, called uh, DTU Compute, which is very much focused on programming. But programming is going to be for everybody. It's a skill that we believe that everybody needs and not just uh, for certain people. And everybody needs to have a certain amount of skills within this and with working with data. So we are aware of the GDPR and the restrictions that that uh, might uh, give us, but uh, we're working close to with our legal department at DTU, and uh, they're ensuring that everything that we do is okay. Um, we're also very aware that uh, the I IoT uh, sector is, is a new sector and therefore uh, very easy to hack. Uh, so, but we can't hold back. We'll just have to start and see what happens. So, and the third thing within data innovation is, is to work with the industry and people around us. Um, working with companies. So, we are already part of uh, an EU project called, called Lightning Metropolis, where we are uh, uh, an example of a new innovating lighting with, uh, with sensors. So this, this has uh, meant that we are in connection with uh, different institutes and researchers at the university studying light um, and local companies. We are also working with the largest furniture uh, manufacturer in Denmark. And they uh, uh, willing to give us free furniture. Uh, and what we have to give back to them is data on how that furniture has been used. So they can test their furniture out in our, in our living lab and because we have all the data. And we're also working with them in building in uh, sensors into the furniture so we can actually get better measurements of how this furniture has been moved around, how often has it been used, do, do our students like red instead of blue, uh, what kind of furniture do they like? So this is, uh, this is a way to, to work with the local companies and also together with uh, researchers studying indoor climate at our university. The third area of focus is facility management. And that is, uh, is a big issue in the future. And this is really where our, f our facility, our um, campus service uh, will save a lot of money. So 10 years from now, we know that there's probably going to be 10,000 extra students at DTU. We're going to be twice as many students. But we're not going to have more space and we're not going to have more funding. So we have to use the buildings better. We can't have seats that are available that nobody knows of. We can't have uh, group rooms that, uh, that people have left even though they have booked it. Uh, we can't have auditoriums that are empty um, when there's so many students. So we really have to work on that. So that's what we're going to use uh, all the sensors to help with. And optimization, this is of course very aiming at being sus uh, sustainable. We're saving a lot of energy for all of DTU and, and only have lights when the people ventilate when needed and only heat and cool when needed. And the last one within that is allocation. When do we actually need staff in the libraries? We can use these sensors to detect when there will be people and we can use the data to predict when will there be people because we know when they leave the auditoriums uh, and we know if they're going towards the library. As an example too, we 
looked at the data from how the, how the toilets had been used. Um, in January, and right here in the corner, you, you can actually see the entrance to the toilets on the three floors. So we try to count how many times the toilets have been used. So, and the yellow line is, is actually how many people are using the whole library times 10. But you can see the curve kind of follows each other. But the big difference is between the red and the blue. The red is on the ground floor, and the blue is on the first floor. And you can see the toilets, the blue ones, are being used much more than the red ones. And we keep having complaints about the toilets being uh, not that clean. So. What can we do about, about that? We also looked into the whole month, and you can see there's a big change between the weeks in that month. So right now, we are working with the company that has the contract of cleaning the whole university. And we're giving them, uh, we, we are working with them, what sensors should we put into the toilets so we can actually only clean when it's needed and not on a schedule every day at 2 o'clock or at 4 o'clock, but actually when it's needed. And we might not have that many toilets at the, at the library, but the whole university probably has about 5,000 toilets. So we can use this principle um, at the rest of the university to save money. So, and right here, it's a little visualization of the CO2 level in the library. And we could see that one of the sensors at the bottom here was unstable. And that actually means that the ventilation in the library was not very accurate in that corner of the library. Uh, so, and when the CO2 level is too high, you can't concentrate that, that well. So this was a way for us to say to the estate, or the campus service, you gotta fix that, you gotta change that uh, sensor so, so the ventilation is right. Otherwise, they would never have figured it out. So some final notes on our Smart Library project. Um, there's this report from Delft University. Um, where there's a team there have looked into uh, smart technologies at universities around the world and has written about it. So if you want to look into that, you can do that. Um, some of our challenges with uh, building this smart library has been changing our, our vision of a, of a library. Um, and, and because this is not, uh, not something that libraries usually do. So it's, it's, it has been a, ch uh, yeah, a challenge. Uh, also rethinking what creates value for our users. And that, uh, as I said earlier, is very much in co-creation with, uh, with the students. And repositioning the library internally. We want the library to be the heart of the university, and, and that's why we want to position ourselves uh, with this research facility too, and, and being involved with everything that takes place about data. Um, but we still don't know how to organize <laughs> ourselves, but uh, we will figure that out in the future. Um, so there are a few barriers. There's always lack of talent when it comes to this, I think, uh, because it's a, it's a public institution, and most, uh, most people that uh, are data scientists or have skills within this, they can, as I showed earlier, go out and get a lot of money uh, in, in private companies. So, and there's always the fear of moving forward, 
but we've just decided let's let's do it and we'll see what happens. We might fail, but uh, then we have tried. And then, of course, the, the GDPR and data ethics. Um, oh, wrong way. But the potential by building this was just so big that we couldn't ignore it, and we, we, we just had to do it. By collecting this data, uh, we're hoping that maybe we can correlate this with data uh, from how the students are actually doing in school. Maybe we can assess the impact of the learning uh, of the students on their grades, on retention. Uh, we can assess our own services and say, we shouldn't have these services anymore. If, if there's no reason to have exhibitions, if nobody's looking at them, why have them? Um, and I've been over the, most of the other ones. It's working with people uh, and innovation and hopefully an inspiration to all of you. Thank you.